institutional, which is kind of the role of teacher or the role of parents as something that's kind of defined with social rules within policy and things like that. And I also kind of look at this idea of a dialectic confrontation that somebody called Nicola Ingram, who's actually lovely. She's really lovely. She was a lecturer at Bath and she sort of used that to explore the concept of where you're confronted with something that you're not used to dealing with and you haven't necessarily got the tools to engage with properly, but you kind of have a bit of a wrangle internally and learn how to deal with it or not. Um, and I find that the cult, that works really well with levels of interaction to kind of explain. And then this is literally Sunday's development. I found a light, a light fitting. And this light fitting kind of <laughs> encapsulates everything really well. I haven't written it up. There's no formal analysis, but I did buy the light fitting. But this kind of underpins my thinking a little bit further. And I'm going to write a blog on it later. But I'm human, so I haven't done it all. So the data was a two, it's part of a two-phase project I've planned, funded by me, myself and I, and supported by Mr. Dr. Ross. But the first phase was between April and May last year, I, no, April and June last year, I did an online survey. There were some binary questions, some Likert scale type questions, and some just write how you feel about different things questions um, that I did on Microsoft Forms. Um, and then I'm hoping in due course to do some interviews with some of the people that participated before. Some of them I'm going to colour because I work with them and know them outside of a Microsoft input. But it was basically looking at parents, fa families' experiences of supporting kids and teachers' experiences and kind of how you expected lockdown learning to be. One of the things that was really like telling actually was thinking about what people understood as dyslexia friendly practice before um coronavirus like 60 percent of the parents that were interviewed didn't even have a clue what was going on to support their kids if anything in school if people did know that work was being adapted they generally thought it was with a ta either in class or out and very little mention of kind of dyslexia friendly powerpoints font changes stuff being printed out in advance for children um and yeah the most common thing was oh they just have a TA they don't I speak as a teacher they don't and I don't think they should in all honesty that's a part of sort of looking further to keep kids independent and to give them tools but the things that teachers drew upon as supporting kids both pre and during Covid were things like dyslexia friendly powerpoints worksheets and multi-sensory stuff so it's kind of where you can hands-on and also um like hearing stuff, seeing stuff, because you can't always do hands on and particularly around coronavirus times because of the weird time that we are currently in. Come on, mouse. So what came out of my research was kind of around the teaching and parenting, parenting and teaching with remote learning was the roles that were expected, the, the expectations, the assumptions that parents and teachers were living up to were unhelpful at best. Um, parents were expected to be the teacher, to be at home, to be kind of drop, able to drop everything from their work while simultaneously working full time from home because everybody can work from home, right? Because everyone's got four laptops when they've got two kids and two parents working. Oh, wait. No, they don't, do they? But the assumption, this ridiculous assumption had, continues. It still continues. And teachers' roles were kind of a bit, a bit woolly and a bit foggy because they were supposed to differentiate work. But you can't do multi-sensory stuff in the same way as you would in a normal world when you're stuck in your classroom with no children or stuck at home with your children around you. It's, it's a battle, but there was an expectation that teachers would do the chat, you know, the chat function that we've got in Zoom or do phone every child during every lesson to talk them through tasks. So there were some really complex roles and the expectations that came from government policy then filtered down into schools that meant parents are at home and they can do everything. Access to devices. It's just not a polite word. Not everyone's got tech. And that is such a hindrance. And that's a hindrance anyway for kids. Um, I literally did a webinar talking about it at half past three today. It's such a hindrance. And the ways of working communication People had to just all of a sudden drop everything. And you know from academic circles, people had to drop everything, learn how to Zoom, learn how to Google Classroom and all the other things with little to no training. So we're all still, we're bumbling a bit less now, but now the game is up. Ofsted are on teachers' backs and schools' backs. So we're expected to be 
assistive tech experts and know how to code and a gazillion other things. And these quotations at the side just encapsulate the trickiness, the, the impossibility that parents and subsequently teachers were dealing with. So the roles that people had informed their interactions. If parents were expected to be teachers, they were expecting teachers to make things teachable. And if teachers were expecting parents to teach, they were just giving them stuff. So again, these kind of really dichotomous positions came out of it where parents were saying that they were differentiating everything. They were doing everything whilst simultaneously home learning, home educating, home working, spinning plates and probably swinging from the chandelier, some of them. And teachers were saying, well, we're doing everything because parents at home can't whilst still not doing everything. So there was just such dichotomy in expectations and the parents and teachers sort of went they, they just missed through no one's fault through no one's fault and I would argue apart from policy because when you have a policy that sets everybody expected as having um, a device but they don't what you're supposed to do when you have a policy that expects learning will continue as otherwise because live learning is the best way to do it and yet Ofsted said it might not be, but the education secretary saying live, live, live is the only way. But everyone's working from home and homeschooling and teachers with kids. It, it's there's so little joined up thinking. And then add into that for dyslexic people and people with literacy wobbles or who just find learning tricky. It's not exclusive to dyslexics, but it's exacerbated. The reading burden of our national curriculum. I read a report from GL assessment that was that 25% of kids have a reading age of 12 or less, I think it was. And they're supposed to learn from home by reading. And if people haven't got a device, you haven't got a screen reader. If mum and dad are working, mum and dad, mum, dad carers can't help you with that. So it just puts everybody even more on the back foot than they already are. Um, sorry, got, got my light fitting in. Um, and this is kind of fitting that into a theoretical framework. I kind of, it, I've put Jenkins's terminology into brackets and this is still a, a very baby framework. I've, I made this last night, it literally happened over the weekend. So individually within this concept, parents and teachers were sort of making sense of what was expected of them and um, dealing with their access to tech. So dealing with their own surroundings internally. So to kind of then give them some motivations for communication, give them some methods for communication and work out how they can do it. And this internal sense making then kind of it intersects and with these little circles, you can see they touch, they do touch. It's such a pretty light fitting and it's such a powerful concept. It made my blood like, I'm so excited. Where they touch, there's a bit of jarring going on. So how, how you inform your interactions, how you inform the point where you talk to other people, you deal with other people is inside, inside that, that sort of self circle happens there. Then you kind of move out to this dialogue circle, I've called it, where it's interactionally, but it's not just internal, not just person to person dialogue. There's still a dialogue going on within an individual. So the little sort of self circle sits inside because it underpins the dialogue circle where you're talking to other people and you're dealing with teachers and parents are talking together trying to work out and then together make sense of the missed expectations of the gap between communications and sort of starting to fulfill the roles that the roles are fulfilled by policy but they're also underpinned by what you make sense of it in yourself and teachers were such gatekeepers to resources in some ways because schools had the handle over um, distributing laptops physically and we, we've got stockpiles stockpiles we've got sort of piles of them in our reception at school still because they're coming in dribs and drabs this dialogue then is kind of surrounded it's, it's bounded by this boundary circle the, which is sort of the field of education in Borgias and speak and it's in oh, it's institution to institution so that underpins everything and the reason it's inter intersecting with the two of the circles is because it underpins everything but it's also bigger than everything so your government policies your exams access filters down but then it also filters back up so it's sort of this notion and they're circular because it all perpetuates itself and the nice thing that I think this does that Borgia and Jenkins doesn't 
is if you kick it, it rolls and it moves. And so it's got that dynamism where health impacts and other fields impact on education. So I love my light thing because it really fits this <laughs> analysis. And I think it's going to grow into something really powerful. Post COVID thoughts, this is kind of thoughts for schools. And actually, if you can get kids the tech and teachers the tech, they can get on with it. And that's my argument. Every single time I talk to government, just give them tech, give them tech. Um, differentiation, kids can self-differentiate. They can change the background colour. They can change the PowerPoints. It's so handy. And actually, for I actually think I know who said this. Um, relationships are the key thing. If you've got your relationships and the tech, they will marry together and make it really potentially really powerful. So there's kind of a new way forward for theory and practice that I made up the name of last night. If you're in YS, in the Women in Science, the Facebook page, you'll have seen me. <laughs> I'm quite sad. Dialectic confrontations are so powerful, like Nicker England nailed it. Um, and that's where we are. There's some more recommendations, identification. It's so important to identify dyslexia, mental health needs underpinning, and give children a computer. Uruguay can do it, so can we. And there's my references. I'll stop talking. That was a whistle stop tour, wasn't it? That was fantastic. Thank you. So uh, that was really interesting. Can I ask uh, if you have, if anyone has any questions, could you unmute yourself? Uh, I think Jasmine has one. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, Helen. That was awesome. I'm, oh, I'm, yes. seeing, I'm seeing like um, a mapping over here for uh, people with dyslexia and uh, autism and autism. oh yeah because mm -hmm. i'm autistic and i'm looking at that i'm going oh this is really nice <laughs> it just feels like it's all kind of percolating together and it's just got this opportunity to have a reciprocal conversation about these things rather than it this kind of idea that gets imposed on everybody mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i asked just i emailed a load of people whose addresses i had um, they're reforming the assistive tech group. I don't really know what it is at the DFE. And I was like, hi, you may remember me from. You want to let me join. <laughs> now, whether I, anybody gets back, like who knows, but I totally agree with you because for me, if, if we work with JCQ, the exam boards, if we work with sort of schools, government, if kids just have a damn computer, they can change it themselves. And if like in Uruguay, it's a school administered computer, um, school can set up the network so that it's exam secure it's not rocket science Uruguay's dinky and as of June 2020 everyone had a computer in a state school like we need. Nah. yeah no I absolutely get what you're saying so yeah I just want to say thank you that was awesome <laughs> thank you that's lovely and I've got the light fitting behind me it's really pretty it's so pretty I bought it this afternoon <laughs> So, do we have any more questions? Oh, Amanda? Uh, yeah, never backward in coming forward. Helen, that was great. Thank you. Oh, uh, I'm not sure I understood all of it, but having homeschooled three children during lockdown for nine weeks, uh, it was okay because they were all in the same year. Um, so we were, <laughs> oh, there's one of them. <laughs> um, they, I was able to use one device uh, and I had three children in year five, six, but um, what, I mean, I'm a teacher, not a primary school teacher, but what came up was stuff, um, issues with one of those children that I don't think had been picked up in class. Um, so I'm in, and of course, if I wasn't even my child, so I couldn't raise concerns. Is there any mechanism for this or do these kids just slip through the cracks um do you know what uh, the number of phone i speak from my kind of professional head on now both my dyslexia assessor head and my in school dealing with a to-do list head um my professional assessor i've got a whole load of assessments coming in in due course because i've worked with a couple of the private schools in and around bath because i know them from being a senko they're just they're like we've got four or five kids from each school helen can you assess them i'm like yeah, because it's parents, carers and families have been confronted with just how difficult some children find it. We've got kids at my, where I work, I work at Stonehenge School down at Amesbury by Stonehenge. And um, they're, 
we've got so many kids who've just wobbled whether it's kind of literacy wise if it's maths wise and actually autism and autist autism spectrum because their routine has been lost they've had to build up a new routine and then all of a sudden the government's like back to school now and some of our our key stage three kids have they've had to isolate you know they've all had to go home and we've got some children are so worried because they gear themselves up to go back and it's fine and we're going back no go home home again so Mm. it's just flung up so many issues to raise awareness you can contact school senko um i i don't know it it depends whether the senko would be able to accept discussions with someone who's not the children's parent parent or guardian i don't know um that would depend on the school i don't know it might be worth a phone call rather than an email if okay thanks a chat would probably be they'd have their ears to the ground then yeah it's worth all the it's worth all the paper it's written on (laughs) thank you right uh did we have another question um, can I just ask quickly, I'm not sure if this is <laughs> exactly related, but in terms of um, assessing children and whatnot during homeschooling, um, finding that a, a child has is struggling, but trying to break, raise that with the, with the parent and the parent saying, no, 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 my child doesn't struggle. They're absolutely fine. You just need to let them get on with it. Is there a way of getting that child support in school without as you say I know it needs really to come from the parent but if the parent's not seeing that they need support do you see what I mean I'm trying to um if they're primary school it's relatively straightforward in that you can say they're struggling with their phonics there'll be there'll be other kids in the class that struggle with phonics so if you've got kind of little phonics interventions going on you could say we're doing we're having a six week however long phonics intervention um, and just say we're doing this as part of our general provision where kids are wobbling um, if it's more schools can refer it depends on your local authority how it works for Wiltshire I think we need parental permission some local authorities may not in all honesty it depends where you are and it's very difficult to say for sure mm. if you've got a saying code where you can do some kind of like the Westford Westford um dyslexia pack is really good there's an autism checklist that i think the national autistic society handles um steve chin has a dyscalculia checklist that you can just download off his website there's various things like that thank you that's okay (laughs) we had a question in the middle is it gavin yeah hello thank you so much that was fabulous um quick question just about software platforms i know i'm a five-year-old and okay um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he, his class used dojo um okay we found that was fine it was asynchronous we're I able to speak to... well of dojo i've never engaged with dojo but people speak well of it what so i guess um just from your research was there, was there a certain platform that people preferred um, people didn't like show my homework because it's just you shove a load of files we use show my homework at school and for certain homework it's fine if that's your principal communication it's not great um the feature that people wanted was to be able to have real-time interaction for for some people like it tends to be for autistic or asc kind of people that sounds so disrespectful and i don't mean it to but people on the autistic spectrum preferred the the written chat function dyslexic people wanted um speaking um which is not really surprising so but the features wanted were being able to look at powerpoints and videos um not have, teams was tricky because the notifications are really like distracting zoom had problems with confidentiality i don't know all of that but it was the features that were more sought after does that make sense it does yeah cool good Perfect. thank you that's all right <laughs> Thanks. Do we have any more questions? I have one if, if everybody else is done. So I wondered if uh, your research has revealed any aspects or advantages that are potentially for ongoing learning post COVID. So um, it seems to me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very visual person and it seems to me like a lot of this moving to screens could potentially be very valuable for people who do not learn either exclusively through words or uh, at all through words so including dyslexic people I mean I'm I'm happy with words but I'm very visual you're light 
fitting was brilliant. Uh, so I'm just wondering, wondering what kind of um, lessons you think might be taken forward and perhaps uh, added to the educational toolkit. I think for the educational toolkit, it, let me think. Um, things where you can watch stuff. Um, mm. So it's if people have, have sat homework, don't just write it down. Like you can do a sound recording. I, I do. <laughs> My kids always get a video of me talking to them and I read what I've put on the homework and then I have a little chat with myself or them about their week at the minute when when I've not seen them so it's that way you can see someone's face is if you can hear someone um and you can use things like YouTube videos they're so handy like they're a really good um free resources for things like maths and science and for sciences you've got stuff like Caboodle which is paid but our kids love it so it's really it's trusting the tech I think um, and teachers need to feel empowered to trust the tech because um, when it works it's brilliant and if you've got no time pressure it's perfect and I think the barrier is just devices and that isn't new knowledge but the significance of no tech for kids with dyslexia specific learning difficulties is it's really highlighted with this because where kids at home have been able to use the immersive reader or like just a text to speak thing they've gone woo and loved it more than they like school whereas if kids haven't got a device or don't know how to use like don't know how to use the, all the accessibility features in microsoft office which are amazing i'm sure apple has them but i'm a microsoft girl then if you don't know it's there you can't use it so i think for me rather than having a computer science curriculum there needs to be also use of it and kids need to be empowered teachers need to be empowered and confident to do it so and I think it's just highlighted that I don't think it wasn't known but I think it's just shown how reliant some kids are and how powerful it can be if they've got access to the right tech I think great that's fantastic so if we could move on to our second speaker so this is uh, Desmond Shadrach uh, he was speaking on black metal, trauma, subjectivity and sound, screening the abyss. So we've gone from Helen's wonderful bubbly <laughs> presentation, so we're now going to the dark side. So let me just <laughs> show my screen. Bear with me one moment. That one and... Okay. Okay. You will see that okay yeah okay um so yeah thank you very much for the intro my name is dr jasmine shadrach um and this is on the mono my monograph that has just come out um in january this year through emerald publishing and there it is in all its lovely horny glory um <laughs> so as you can see on the left hand side it says from survivor to phd to monograph and um, I'm a survivor of domestic abuse and I then needed to know what to do as a survivor with the trauma that I was then carrying with me because I actually found that um, therapy was insufficient and didn't work. I was also quite costly so I think it's a big barrier to a lot of people because it's quite expensive so what can you do um, to help yourself? I was a musician anyway I've been an extreme metal guitarist for the last 21 years um so I was like right what can I do so I started a band and that band then became the praxis of my PhD which then I was able lucky enough um, in a lot of ways to to turn into my my first monograph and there's a reason why there are uh, horns on the front cover which uh, I'll be able to show you shortly so you know I can talk about this quite glibly um, that this was a, a three part journey, you know, survivor PhD monograph. Um, but actually it was it was extremely difficult. And I think, you know, having been in, uh, you know, cultural production in the UK metal scene for a, for a very long time, I was already aware that it was not exactly the most welcoming of scenes for women, let's say. 
Um, but I didn't really notice it particularly when I first started because I was a bit younger. My my feminism wasn't probably as as developed as it is now. There weren't really any women, certainly not on stage. And so I didn't really notice the kind of crap remarks that got thrown at me. So I was just quite blase about the whole thing, shrugged it all off. But, you know, as time goes on and the conversations and the comments kept coming, I then started to think, well, you know, maybe I've, I've had enough of this and I wanted to kind of step away from it. But then I found myself in this um, terrible situation of intimate partner abuse. And when I was lucky enough to get out, as lots of women aren't, um, I thought I need to do something that's pragmatic, that is effective and that I have some kind of control over. So I then started with the help of four other wonderful people, a black metal band called Denigrata. And from that, I then realised that, you know, because I had actually already been doing a, a, a PhD beforehand and it was the wrong PhD. And I'd, I went to have this meeting with my director of studies and they went, you don't want to do this, do you? And I was like, not really. So I decided to change it um, after I'd already written 50,000 words, but that's a different but different thing. But I then realised I already had everything that I needed actually at my fingertips to be able to, to write my PhD. And then I found this stunning methodology called Interpretive Performance Autoethnography. And the book that I used was by Norman K. Denzin. And it was just, it blew my tiny mind because what it allowed me to do is use my experiences as the data for my theoretical analysis. Because initially I had started looking at other women's experiences and I'm going through all of this stuff going, well, that happened to me. I, I know what that means. I know what that feels like. I, you know, I understand what this is. And then it occurred to me, I said, well, why am I not analysing what happened to me? So then I found auto ethnography. And honestly, it was just that light bulb moment. You know, as as researchers, we love those moments, right? We just go, oh, this is it. It was meant to be. And it enabled me to access what Denzin calls turning point events. So things that we recognise, we, we remember and we go, oh, shit, that was a big deal. That meant something and obviously during the during my experience of the abuse I couldn't think about any of it I blocked it all out and then slowly but surely when I was in the band I was able to safely re-investigate and revisit these turning point events and go right okay now I have a much better understanding of of what this is I'm safe so I'm able to re-engage with what these things mean and so I was able to write them into my PhD in a, in a, in a rigorous, solid framework. So it's not solipsistic navel gazing because that's, you know, it's not an autobiography. It's auto ethnography. You have to be able to um, research and analyze what these turning point moments mean. It was painful, but it was absolutely necessary because I, you know, we all need to survive and we'd like to be able to do that in a healthy way. Right. You can't carry this stuff in your heart because you will rot from the inside out that's just that's how it is so you've got to do something so I became a guitarist and, and vocalist and by vocalist I mean well I screamed <laughs> but the the power of being able to do that meant that there was a very visceral very immediate engagement of me being able to scream out all that hurt and put it in a song that we had collectively composed together. So we had that solidarity between us all. So once I discovered this gorgeous framework, I then knew that I needed some kind of feminist psychoanalysis to get in there to, you know, it's akin to sitting on a, a therapist's couch, but on my terms rather than somebody else's. So I used Judith Butler and Julia Kristeva, who I adore. And there were some real key ideas from both of these wonderful women and you know, with Judith Butler, it was um, giving an account of oneself. It was it was the idea of corporeality, you know, how you move your body on stage. And a big thing about trauma is you feel divorced from your physical self. You know, you're, you're trapped in your head. You're trapped in these awful reliving cycles of what happened. And by be, by moving your body, whether you're going for a run or whether you put your guitar on or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You suddenly got that centered approach of 
drawing your soul back into your body. I remember with Julia Kristeva, it was the idea of the deject, the idea of the corpse and abjection, of course. Um, and so I realized that working together as a unit gave me, <laughs> it gave me a sense of catharsis and it gave me a sense of peace. Now, there I am. <laughs> now you can see why the horns were significant. Now, of course, I recognized then that me, myself as a woman was one thing, woman as a collective was another, but then you take both of those concepts and you plonk them in the middle of a, of a hegemonic patriarchal music form. Oof, that was tricky. Now, honest, honestly, all the other musicians that we played with, I mean, there were no other women. That was that was just it, apart from the people in my band. Um, but the difficulty didn't lie with the other musicians. It's like I I'd, I'd garnered some degree of respect simply because I was a musician. But the audience was was where the problem where the problems were, the, the comments didn't stop just because I was on stage and I naively thought that that gave me some degree of distance, it gave me some degree of um, protection and actually that wasn't the case at all. So I've actually just included um, a quote here from Butler um, about the idea of woman as subject and it talks about juridical power and the juridical power of a lot of popular music um, formats there are just these enclaves of gatekeepers and you know you're a woman here why are you wearing that t-shirt can you tell me all the albums of the band that you of you wore or the t-shirt that you're wearing and you just think oh my god and actually yes I can do that because I'm autistic so I'm able to list off all of these things but I'm not going to give you the satisfaction right so yeah <laughs> but you're confronted by this juridical hegemonic system that doesn't really want you there but I was there nonetheless. And I knew that my path to get there was significant and meaningful. And I knew I wasn't the only one. I knew I wasn't the only woman who had ever experienced anything like this. But similarly, I also knew that I was in a fairly unique position because I was a musician, I was a guitarist. And I really wanted to be able to do something meaningful with that. I wanted to share my story. You know, I, I get really tired of, the abusers stories winning out and those of us that are survivor victims are crushed into silence because the time for that is gone so I my biggest hope of course with with my monograph was that I had an opportunity to not just talk about my voice but raise the awareness of other women's voices as well so we made sure that in the in the back of the monograph there's a whole list of resources for people that would perhaps need them like rape crisis women's aid all that kind of thing um because you can't put a book out like that without having some opportunity for people to, kn to know where to go if they need it okay and then my my last slide because i'm running out of time is the idea of this kind of dialogical space so I recognise that through my own discomfort and unease um, that Denigrata became this gorgeous space that I was enabled, that we had all enabled together, that it meant something. And um, I, just, I just want to finish finally with this last quote from Kristeva. So through my discomfort, unease, dizziness stemming from an ambiguity that through the violence of a re revolt against demarcates a space out of which signs and objects arise. Thus braided, woven, ambivalent, a heterogeneous flux marks out a territory that I can call my own because the other, having dwelt in me as alter ego, points it out to me as loathing. And there on the left is one of the professional photographs we had done for the band, and that is my alter ego. It enabled me to have a safe, place to put all of my pain to do something effective with it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, that was absolutely fantastic and very interesting. I'll throw the floor open again. Do we have any questions? Helen, knock yourself out. <laughs> Don't say that because I probably will one day. <laughs> Just because I'm a Wally. Oh my gosh, Jasmine, that was epic. Um, <laughs> like, I didn't understand all the words because they were big, but I'll read them again. But what I wanted to ask you, Denigrata is your band? Well, it was. I mean, um, I had to stop it last year because I got an acquired disability because of my trauma. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just starting to be able to get comfortable wearing my guitar again. So I'm now, the, the other woman in the band, 
that was in with Dena Grata. She and I, work, and I are working together again. So I now have my guitar with me at home. So, you know, if I can't stand up and play it, at least I can sit down. So the name Denigrata is yes. that Latin for denigrated? Yes, denigrated. So denigrate. So I thought if I called myself that, then nobody else can. Okay. Because I'm taking ownership of it, right? That's so right. if, if I, I was wearing a hat, that's oh, fine. thank you. <laughs> so that was the idea behind it. You know, we all had these pseudonyms. We all wore these costumes on stage, and actually, what and. and it's called corpse paint in black metal so effectively trying to it's the the dead living and the living dead this representation this liminality and what that does is apart from the whole theatricality of it all mm. actually gave me a locus of intent it gave me this kind of space where i could just pour all this stuff from me my everyday self this you know this kind of bruised identity into this empowered identity with the you know the antlers and the huge hair and the and the face makeup and everything and I suddenly felt like I could be her and it made me feel much stronger I think you're bloody brilliant <laughs> your work is bloody brilliant well done awesome. thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm blushing now <laughs> I think we had another question was it Alan did you have a question I did, yes. I, I guess I was curious. Thank you, Jasmine. It's, it's a great way. And autoethnography is a great uh, tool to express oneself, uh, experience and the social implications of being, well, I guess, being alive. I was curious to know whether Denigrata changed through the process of the work that you did. I think the, I think the music did, actually. Okay. It started off with... Um, rather than using a drummer, we used a DAW, a digital audio workstation called... Um, uh, I've gone for, babe, what what do we call what do we use in Delagrata for drums? I've forgotten it. Not Audacity. Ableton, thank you. Oh, sorry, my brain, brain fog. So it actually gave us a kind of industrialized texture to a lot of the, the percussive elements of it, which was great, but it upset a lot of the, the purists, let's say. And then gradually we then did get a drummer. And so the music and felt a more it felt more fluid and more like the tides washing over you. It was much more washy. Mm. And so the music became a little softer. So the more I was able to investigate my trauma mm. and I could feel it easing, feeling the tension ease a little bit, then the, the music took on a, a more more rounder edges. So that's mm. a great question. Thank you. <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it like that, but yeah. I guess if I could just add add to that, I was I was curious to whether um, the alter ego existed um, beyond you or whether she lives within you now. Another awesome question, right? So when the band finished, that's exactly the question I asked myself. I was like, I don't feel ready to give her up. It feels like she has this lifeblood, all of her own but it needed to accommodate my um, my acquired disability. And I, I just got my diagnosis for age 43 for my autism. And I was like, oh my God, my entire life has been turned upside down and I'm learning so many new things about myself. Mm. So I then took it, I, I then made her into this image to be photographed instead. So mm. I did a whole photographic series, that's in the end of, the, of my monograph as well. I then uh, created a web, well, I didn't, I paid for somebody to do it because I can't do coding. Um, my, my website last year, where it's got all of this stuff on it, I started painting again. And she has become this force for me to focus on to mm. ensure that there's some degree of progression that I don't feel like it's all creeping back again. Mm. Because it can, if you don't have effective uh, management in place, I think. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, Kat, uh, you're muted. There we go. There we go. Hiya. Hi. Um, I just want to say fantastic. Loved it. Um, and I just wanted to, to ask, I think you've kind of already answered in, in the last part what you just said about the, the locus of, of control evolving. Um, I'm fascinated in this as a sort of I don't like the word survivor, but you know what I mean? Somebody has been through a lot and, and been on that journey. Do you feel that it's changed, um, you know, evolved through your music and, you know, that um, alter ego, et cetera? Do you know what I mean? I'm not very good at putting this into words. Yeah, no, no, today. It's okay. yeah I, think, I think I understand what you mean. So it's like, you know, is she the same as 
now as when we started the band. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think she is. I initially we didn't really have much of an on stage look, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say probably after the first six months of, of gigging and performing live, it started to evolve naturally. And I, 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 I could feel what she was becoming. And then after about a year, we'd have myself and the other woman in the band, Frankie, um, we'd have people come up to us after gigs and go, do you two look like witches on purpose? And I'm like, no, but it's interesting that you said that, which then opened up a whole other door of understanding what that representation means. And I then wrote about that in terms of like restorative feminism mm. and just this idea of this, you know, patriarchal, patriarchally inscribed villain that actually isn't the villain at all. And just reinvestigating how we could utilize that as a mechanism to help women get better from all of this, right? Because we know what the stats are. We know what's happened over the last couple of weeks, right? not just Sarah Everard, bless her heart, but, you know, we, we understand what the realities of this are. So I realised that my work is, is quite pertinent at the moment, but then you think, well, it's pertinent anyway. So I think, you know, my alter ego has, has adapted, let's say, but she's just as angry now as she was in the, when we started her in the beginning. But you've got that right to be angry. You know, there's, there's no reason for you to to not be angry you know with everything you've been through but I think you know it's, it's interesting isn't it that that locus of control you've taken back that control you've become a stronger person internally in yourself and I just wondered you know whether how the music your music helped you and I don't know how to put it that's, this is, this that's actually really complicated really, I'm just very really interested in survival and you know and ev evolution you know changing who you are as a person for for what you want to be a stronger person and I'm just fascinated with how how the music's been involved in that well, trauma is going to change you anyway yeah and it's ultimately when you're starting to feel a, a little bit more composed um so after the initial shock has had time to to settle um I was never going to compose I think when you've been through that you're not going to compose pop <laughs> no <laughs> it was I was it was you know nothing was going to be in a major key for me because it didn't it didn't ring true because the emotions needed to match the sonic representation and of course that was going to be heavy distortion it was going to be minor keys it was going to be pentatonic scales it needed to have that balance between the two and it was, that was absolutely crucial because then once I'd had that emotional match my emotions and the sonics matched then You've built the bridge then it can start coming out of you so yeah you're absolutely right thank, thank you, you. <laughs> anyone else i have a, a final question if i may um i really loved your part uh, about occupying the spaces where we're not supposed to be um i am uh, in uh, science fiction and comic book fantasy fandoms and how exciting that, that is like that is massive, massively bad problems with gatekeeping, and you're not a proper fan if. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, really and I was wondering if you have any. Um, as a hobby, by the way, my academic pursuit is archaeology. But um, uh, I was wondering if you, in the course of your research, found anything that was sort of looking at the kind of the concept of, of gatekeeping and that kind of attitude from a sort of an academic perspective, because I, 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 I can tell you there are a few Facebook groups that would be interested to hear about it. So interestingly, my academic engagement with that has come after the fact, because usually when these sorts of um, engagements happen, mm. I, mean, I never think of good comebacks at the time, like <laughs> something shit will happen and like, you know, two, two days later, I'm like, oh, that's a really good comeback. But then I can't go back and refine the post because, you know, it's too late by then. Yeah. Um, so my, my general reaction has learned, to, I've had to learn this because we had to get over the politics of politeness, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, am I safe to be able to respond to you and your awful comments in a particular way, right? Yeah. So after those two things are dealt with is deal with it immediately or you leave it. Yeah. It has to be one or the other. And if you are prepared to take that person on, you always have to think of what cost it's going to have to your emotional labour. But then, you know, it's just you're potentially you're just kicking the ball into the long grass by not dealing with it because someone else, somebody else is going to have to deal with it. But 
I think gradually, I mean, it's it's a glacial progress. I realise that, particularly in academia. Um, it's just slowly but surely, I think things are changing. And the idea, the concept of the gatekeeper is, I mean, it's really in there, isn't it? It's really embedded. But the best way to deal with it is to confront it. If it comes at you, then stand your ground. You know, don't don't be shoved out of your passions because somebody else thinks they know more than you. We were we, you know, it, that's 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 rubbish as far as I'm concerned. You've had people say it to me, well, why are you wearing that band T-shirt? Do you even know who they are? Did you buy that from H and M? Like, no, I bought it at the gig. And it's just it's just that kind of condescension, this assumption that you don't know anything. Well, actually, yes, I do know quite a lot about it, but. So that just, yeah, you've got to stand your ground. Yeah, that's perfect. So I think uh, now we're going to move on to our next speaker. If we don't have any more, no more questions, I think we're good. OK, that's perfect. So our final speaker for tonight is Dr. Amanda Haste on refocusing music and identity. So more music, challenges of creating a monograph from a musicological thesis. Okay, so there we go. Right, can everybody see my screen? Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes, good. Okay, I'll just change this setting here okay there okay now um unlike the previous two um, papers um there's absolutely no theoretical background um for my paper it's all about the practicalities of turning a thesis into a book um, and it will be useful to start by briefly explaining my original thesis, which I defended way back in 2009, and my subsequent academic journey, before I look at where I am today in terms of turning that original work into a monograph. So, here is the title page of my thesis, which is primarily musicological. It concerns contemporary Anglican monastic communities. Um, and the point about these is that they have a discontinuous history. Um, when Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries um, in the 16th century, monastic life became illegal in England and remained so for 300 years until the Gothic revival of the Church of England in the mid 19th century. And from about 1840 onwards, Anglican monasteries and convents were established and they modelled themselves on the tradition of Western monasticism with its cloisters and habits and a life revolving around the daily office and the liturgy. And the lit these were sung to the chant. Now, of course, my primary interest is musicological. And musically, these communities' options were limited. They could either adopt the pre-Reformation monastic office, which was Catholic and in Latin, with its accompanying chants, so it actually came with its own music, or they could use the English texts of the Book of Common Prayer, but these were far too limited for their needs and they were largely said or sung to congregational music, which didn't really work for monasteries and convents. Um, some communities show, chose the first route, the Latin Roman Catholic route, and were known as Anglo-Catholics. Others chose the Book of Common Prayer, a book of common prayer and were known as prayer book Catholics and by the 20th century there were hundreds of these communities across Britain and they coexisted quite happily until a huge upheaval caused by the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s which saw Latin based communities abandoning their Latin worship for English. Importantly every community acted autonomously developing their own music to support their worship. And they've since constantly revised their musical practices to reflect not only church diktats, but also their own pref um, preferences. For instance, many female communities, um, often hotbeds of feminism, 
have completely revised all their texts so the language is inclusive and every time there's a textual change the music has to be redone to, communicate, to accommodate this. So in the light of this rather curious history my thesis set out to examine the role of music in supporting the religious life of today's monks and nuns, examining their compositional strategies and their use of sung and instrumental music in worship and for recreation. And I thought it was all about music, until my viva, when my external examiner said, but it's all, ident all about identity, isn't it? Well, of course I agreed. Anyway, my examiners encouraged me to publish my thesis as a monograph, so in 2010, I excitedly attended a course run by a commissioning editor from a major publishing house. It was very encouraging. They even suggested a title, Monastic Music Now, with an exclamation mark. So how to get from this to this? Well, I tried. For a whole year, I tried. But every publisher that I approached told me my work was too niche so I gave up and started publishing my thesis chapters as journal articles and as book chapters. And I found myself looking more in terms of identity than the music itself. So here's a list of my publications from my thesis chapters. You can see on the left um, the original thesis and the shape of it and the right on the right those chapters that were later published. As you can see, over the years, I've published from every chapter except those that were purely musicological. And those ones are actually pretty thick with musical analysis. And my research focus has changed. You can see that the last publication from my thesis was five years ago, because I've been going in other directions since then, though sometimes weaving in material from my thesis. So fast forward to 2020, and following a very motivational NCIS webinar on the topic, of which more later, I decided to refocus and see if I could create a monograph on music and identity. I already had the rework chapters you see here. And here are my additional thesis related publications. And as you can see, um, the driving force here is identity, whether through music or through language. So I've, I've put one, um, the second one, a language clearly understanded of the people, which is a quote from grammar, um, and that was the use of Latin versus English and how they constructed their identity, either Anglo-Catholic or the prayer book Catholics. So how Anglican were they and how Catholic weren't they? Really interesting. <clears throat> so how to produce a co coherent book from what I've already published. How to pull it all together? Well, the original thesis had its own structure and coherence, and boy, do we all sweat blood over that. But I need to let go of that. This isn't going to be the book of the thesis. So what's my new focus? I need something that will encompass areas I didn't know I was going to get into when I wrote my thesis, but that won't be too diffuse. I need to revisit all my publications, seeing them as part of a new whole rather than standalone pieces in diverse specialisms. If I'm to say, stay focused, I need to decide what to keep and what to ditch. And it's going to be a lot harder to leave things out than to keep them. I can't even write my book proposal until I know the basic structure of the book. So. Having decided what to include, I need to look at each section in detail. But what do I do with it? My published work has all been refocused and extensively modified and updated by the peer review process. However, the most recent was five years ago, and I haven't even got as far as the book proposal yet, so I definitely will need to update them again. How am I going to do this? Well. I can see myself seeking out recent publications, preferably open access or available online as I'm not made of money, and replacing older citations with newer ones that make the same point or support my own. 
That feels rather like shoehorning newer references into an older work, but I can't see any way around that. Also, my primary data were gained from several surveys. Do I need to repeat these? Is it even possible? Some communities no longer exist. I had about six key contributors, at least three of whom have since died. Do I need to start all over again with data collection? Will it look bad to be relying on such old data? I mean, I, I finished my research in 2008, um, so my surveys started in 2005. You know, we're talking over 15 years here. Can this data even be reproduced? Also, on an even more practical level, I now live in France and it's not so easy to fly back and forth to visit people, especially now with all the restrictions. Above all, can I return to this work when I've already moved so far away from it? Well, I've given this a lot of thought and I've concluded that there are certain things I need to do if I'm to achieve this. First of all, nobody said it would be easy. In practical terms, my big takeaway from the NCIS webinar on publishing your research was that it's a good idea to get an editor to keep you on track, and this I've done. So shout out to Jess Far Cox at the Dirty Comma, who actually was Jasmine's um, editor, and it's Jazz that introduced me to her, and thanks, it's, that's brilliant. It's working out really well because she's an experienced pair of eyes who knows what publishers are looking for. It's not too expensive either and it's definitely keeping me on track. I've joined or created writing sessions to give me the space to write, and that's allowing me to give 100% to this project at those times, only a few hours a week, but it's really helping. And that's rather than spending a lot of the week thinking about it and feeling guilty that I'm not actually doing anything about it. I also need to keep in mind that this is a new project, not the book of the thesis. The thesis is in the past, my work has evolved. And finally, life is a work in progress, so keep looking forwards and not back. Wish me luck and thanks for listening. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> You're getting some extra clapping from the small person here. It's so sweet. Yes, it oh, is. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. I know that was fantastic. <laughs> Um, oh, hello, person. <laughs> say hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, <laughs> and and uh, Sophie and I would like to know if anyone has any questions for Amanda. Oh, I think Linda does. Yeah. Oh, Amanda, it. that was brilliant. Thank you for doing. You've touched on the pra the real practical issues. We hear so much about how you must turn your thesis into a book, and but you've touched on the real life issues and the actual doing of it. Mm. Have you managed to work out, I think my question is, have you managed to work out your new focus or your new direction? Do you know, do you know what the core is going to be or the, do you know what I mean? The... Yeah, um, I think <clears throat> I, I booked a focus mate session or couple um, last week and they're 50 minutes long and that deadline really worked. And I, I decided to take a good long, hard look at my chapters. Uh, and I printed out the abstracts from each chapter. And looking at it, it became very clear that, for instance, there's a chapter on creative response to prayerful silence. I love that paper. I loved the whole concept of that. Um, but it, it doesn't work if I'm going to do a book on music and identity. That does not work at all. So I'm going to ditch that, and I'm okay with that. Um, I've also found out that a lot of the stuff from... The composition chapters I've actually used um, refocusing to um, basically the difference between secular and religious identity because I found that what happens when people enter the religious life they moderate their own listening and their own playing and what instruments they play for instance you never hear a saxophone um, flute guitar recorders the main instruments so instrumental choices, but I think where I have chapters on instrumental choice and compositional um, techniques and things, where I've refocused is how is this working towards identity construction? 
So that has to be really identity construction um, in the sense of introjection. So you, you tell yourself, this is who I am, and projection, that you show others who you want them to see. Uh, and we all do that. Um, I'm always intrigued with desert island discs that um, politicians always have. Oh, here are the fun bits and here's the poppy bits to show that I'm a normal person. And here's the classical bits to show that I've got culture, you know, and it's a whole construction about this is who I am, but I, I, I need to show you all these facets of my personality. Of course, there are those who only choose recordings of their own <laughs> <Fun. laughs> that tells you a lot about them. but yeah it's got to be about identity construction and i have to have that sort of uh fil rouge that uh, as we say in french um so that that's kind of guiding thread mm. that goes all the way through so yeah got to be about identity construction through music yeah. brilliant thank you any more questions <laughs> I think Jasmine has one. <laughs> She's waving very hard. Hello. Thank you, Amanda. That was awesome. Just, just quickly, I didn't know your middle name was Jane Austen. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no relation. <laughs> Long story. I'll tell you sometime. <laughs> I'm just looking at your first page. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> How are you feeling about your thesis versus? the book that it's now coming into, are you finding that your feelings for it are kind of splitting? Because you know how we feel about our PhDs, but mm. we're covetous and precious about them. And I just yeah. wondered if you're, if you're, how are you feeling now about this emerging blossom that is your new book out of what was your PhD? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Emotionally, you invest so much emotionally in that thesis and you have crafted every word of that thesis but now i think actually it's been quite useful having the sort of 10 11 years since then because i can now see that some of it is i wouldn't say immature but you know kind of i've done that and i think i'm ready to move on and and refocus um but the problem is what do i keep am i going to have to rewrite every chapter the ones that have already pub been published that's okay they've been refocused and i'm i'm okay i just need to update them but the other things that's that's going to be where the the real nub is <laughs> so yeah we shall see couldn't find the button there uh, do we have any other, uh, oh, oh, Helen's got one. Oh, hello. Sorry. I am like rent to mouth this evening. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, but I was, I was really curious as to whether you're religious. Cause it's like, I'm religious. I'm Christian. So that's sort of my background. That's where it comes from. But like, I'm Baptist. So I don't know the first thing about stuff like that, <laughs> um, but if you're religious or not did that religious or notness affect how you engaged with the music to be able to analyze it i don't know anything about music analysis at all that's my background on it it's just <laughs> i was just curious well yeah um and in fact i had to do an or uh, an ethnographic disclosure at the beginning of my thesis mm -hmm. you know usually you keep yourself out of it you're speaking in the third person but this was kind of ethnographic and I had to I had to have a presence mm. and to do that I had to say where I was coming from and that was I am a white middle class middle aged female uh, I was brought up in the Anglican tradition but I am basically agnostic so although I totally respect their choice I mean I could never be a, a religious a monk or a nun um, I don't adhere to those beliefs but i totally respect other people's beliefs um so i i have this emic and etic perspective you know i'm a woman you know the nuns are women um and really interestingly when i interviewed men i got different types of responses and i actually had to re um rework the way i was giving them questions 
because otherwise I, I would they wanted a straight question and I had to give a straight answer. Anyway, that was that was a very much a gender thing. So that that played into the gender identity. Um, but I, you know, there's a lot that I'm seeing from the inside and also a lot that I'm seeing from the outside. And that certainly has got to impact on the way that you interpret what you are hearing. Yeah. Because you're always interpreting the, the data. Thank you. That's really interesting. I can see Hannah busy with Sophie. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was just rescuing the other mouse that she's playing with. The sack. Oh, right. Mouse. Yes. Okay. Oh, it's there. Barbara, it's there. you had a question? Yes, I have a question. Thank you very much, Amanda, for that. That was. Um, Any very... other questions? Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm in the process not of doing a monograph, but I did some uh, co worked piece of um, research. Tw 2012 mm -hmm. um, with two other people, one of whom I'm still very much engaged with. Uh, the other person has gone AWOL, <laughs> completely doesn't answer anything. We know oh, she's no. alive. Um, so I'm kind of with you on trying to, because there's so much uh, literature that's happened as we wrote it and um, we're having quite a struggle. And I wondered if you had from what you've learned already in terms of bringing yourself up to date and I understand you have a target of, of bringing identity to, to, to this so it's you're going in a certain direction but it seems to me that the exponential rise of literature it's almost like trying to get hold of an amoeba but it's massive mm. you know it's just huge and I wondered if you wanted to pass any help on to the rest of us if we're about keeping it contained I mean you've talked about mm. having um, someone to work with and how the structure of that but this is just for me it's about the literature it's just completely I mean you know overwhelming that that is what really frightens me actually because I know as I start reading more I'm going to completely find things that are absolutely fascinating <laughs> and I'm going to want to go off and follow the, all those all those directions and you can't of course um, so yeah that's that's going to be difficult I and mean, what I do do is kind of put things in folders yeah. um, I keep finding interesting up-to-date you know, new stuff that's come out um, I'll get a notification about something um, you know from journals I get notifications from various journals and I always read them through to see if there are any papers um, and what I do is I file those papers in an email folder basically and just file the link yeah um and i now need to look at all those links because i've got a lot of them now and then do a a, a sorting out and see what's um what's relevant and what isn't but i'm going to have to stay very focused on that and it's almost like every five minutes i have to say this is what you're doing remember what you're doing don't go off on a tangent. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is is write down, physically write down um, the relevant bits and try not to get too waylaid. But I'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> it's a constant, constant problem for us. <laughs> it is. And that's, and even without full access to journals, it's an issue, mm. let alone if you, you know, you can access the journals. Exactly. And that, and that kind of limits what you use, because if you simply can't, you know, pay 25 quid for a peek at one article, you know, and I can't, um, then I'm just not going to get at it. Obviously, there's the Facebook group, um, ask for PDFs from people with institutional access, completely illegal, I'm quite sure. Um, but that's very fruitful. So I recommend those. Um, and SciHub, I guess. Um, but yeah, that that limits it, but for all the wrong reasons. Yes, just because things are paywalled. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have got a distantly protesting small person now, but hopefully she won't be too loud over the microphone. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, it, it has been that has been really interesting. Oh, you can hear her. Can't you? She's she's <laughs> not. Nice. Nice. Um, <laughs> so, do we have any more questions for Amanda? 
Are you at cats at the bottom? Uh, that, this gets complicated. What do I call you? Amanda, Dr. Hayes, or mum? Call me mum, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, mine, mine's uh, quieter, but after not that quiet. all these years of, of mum studying, I still struggle <laughs> to understand. I have to say, I still struggle to understand what she does. Um, <laughs> but just when she said about writing groups that's something that something you've said to me mum my, this is my writing group time you're not to disturb me i'm focused and i have to say that that's um for anyone who's struggling to keep focus that seems to be i mean i mum grounds me i ring her and i say i can't do rah, 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 and she goes right explain it to me and then i'm back mm. um so yeah i'm i'm still struggling to understand what she does trying to get my head around it but um <sighs> I don't know. It's fascinating, um, and I'm just following her lead with things. Really, <laughs> I just wanted to say that. So <laughs> I, think, I don't I think... understand anything that you do. She's doing a master's in mental health sciences. I have no idea what she's talking about when I proofread her stuff. <laughs> she just goes, looks good. <laughs> Got long words, and it must be okay. <laughs> But yeah, no, it wasn't a, a question as such, just a, you know, I'm I'm learning from this lady here and from all of you, every, everything I've seen tonight has been amazing and I'm really grateful to have been able to take part in it. So thank you, because <laughs> I've never done this before. So I'm just learning. <laughs> We're all just learning our entire lives. We're just learning. I think Linda's got a question. Yeah, yeah. can I just recommend it? Hannah mentioned earlier about the Women in Academia Support Network mm -hmm. on Facebook. How yep. helpful and supportive that is to join. Um, email me or PM me if you want me to. You have to be nominated, as it were, recommended or so put your name forward. Um, Do you but need it's to a, have a PhD or anything because I don't have a PhD uh, yet. <laughs> no, no, no. Some kind of academic affiliation is ideal. So if you do a student, that's fine. No, it is the most. I think it's got about oh, more than eleven thousand members now. You can ask. You can rant. You can rave. You can ask silly questions, dark questions. You can it's ask or any advice. It's amazing. Yeah, it's highly recommend it. And a very safe space, supportive space. Yeah. I just put it in the chat. Again. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can I just echo Kat's words? Actually, um, that it's just thank you all so much for a wonderful evening. It's been really, really great. It's really lifted my spirits. Thank you all so much. Oh, good. <laughs> well, I've I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am back. I am back orally, but you won't see me because I've got a child making a chaotic mess around me. So, um, oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. It has been absolutely fantastic. Really, really great session today, and um, I'm hoping that we all will be able to do something else like this very, very soon. It's really been been a great time. Uh, I'm sorry we had a little bit of trouble with the emails. I think we've, we've discovered we had some difficulty getting emails into our inboxes from the forwarding address. So we are investigating that now and hopefully by the time we next do anything like that, that will be all sorted. But uh, uh, we're still developing this. So I suppose a few gremlins are to be anticipated. Yeah. Anyway, Can I just, um, just say a word, Hannah? Mm -hmm. And with my other hat on, um, as um, I'm president of NCIS, National Coalition of Indian Scholars, yay! Um, um, we have actually recorded this um, session, okay? Um, so we need to decide what we're going to do with the recording. What I suggest we do is um, put it on our YouTube channel um, and then give the link to maybe the Fire UK uh, mailing list or if people prefer just the people that have attended this session uh, but I'm sure other people would like to um, see the recording um, so um, we'd have to ask you all if you're all right with that yeah. if you give your consent yeah. um, so yeah, absolutely. can I just have a show of hands for everybody that I will give my consent this. verbally <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine with it. do whatever okay good. Cool. Yep. So everybody's Bye. happy okay because we we have to get consent and release and all the rest of it for all this stuff otherwise somebody will say i didn't want to have my face on recorded um but it won't be open it'll just be some to anybody that has the link okay so i'll leave it to the fire uk committee to decide what they want to do about that but just to let you know yeah 
And as Fire UK coordinator, whatever that means, <laughs> um, we do have a small steering committee. We're very, a very informal organisation because COVID has prevented us with all the restrictions on doing all sorts of opening bank accounts and doing all the <coughs> stuff we'd have liked to have done. It's formally constitute ourselves. We're having to keep things low key. We do have some more events scheduled. Um, anybody who would like to be on the committee, we're very small, very friendly. We only meet every... I think our last meeting was in December. We'll, we'll be arranging another one for next month. Mm -hmm. um, an email will be going out to committee members shortly in the morning. Um, if anyone would like to get involved, get it help. Got any ideas for events? Is there anything you'd like to do? Any topic, anything? Or, or if you've got any ideas, you may not want to do it yourself. Too much hard work. But please let us know, because we this was this came out of the public demand, as it were. Um our previous event, one of the events back in November about the challenges of being an independent researcher, again came from people asking for that. So we're very much open to ideas and suggestions. So please email us, get in touch, whatever. Okay. Yeah, and would be great. And if you want to be on the committee, even better. Just email so, me. Yes, any, any more people on the committee would be very welcome. <laughs> to share the load, <laughs> which is a very small load. And we're very nice, very informal, very laid back. And our yeah. committee meetings yeah. are very short. Yeah, and can I can I just say thank you to Fire UK um, for for um, starting for instigating. Sorry, I'm completely losing my words now. Instigating <laughs> this event, it, it was really good for me because I have not presented anything for a whole year now, first time ever, and it made me really crystallise what I was trying to do with this book. So just doing the paper has actually helped the process. So thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Thank I you. I've been excused oh, by a pretty light fitting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's That's so pretty. Are you going to put the light fitting oh. up now? Yeah, but I don't know where to put it. Like, <laughs> in your I'm, office. Well, I'm in my office, but we, we've got like spotlights and this well, is- Well, can't use it as a wall decoration or something? Oh, no. I don't know, which I might need, I need a new stand lamp anyway, so if it's one that can go on. So not only research, but home deco as well. What more can you ask? Mr. Dr. Ross loved it. Credit to the boy, he's he's a good egg. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everybody. I've got to go now, so yeah. love you and leave you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.